Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, September 19th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for September 19th, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you'd like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City manager Van Milligan? Here. Thank you. And city attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Mayor Kavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. We will move on to presentations. We have the 2022 Telegraph Herald Rising Star Award recognition. Good evening, so happy to be here tonight. My name is Megan Gloss, I'm the features editor for the Telegraph Herald. Last week we had the honor, um, our annual honor, our 20th annual honor as a matter of fact, of recognizing 12 different young professionals within the community that have not only made significant contributions in their career field, but to the community at large. And we have two of those members uh, who are affiliates with the city of Dubuque here tonight, Heather Satterley and Temwa Fieri. And we do have two video presentations to present for each of them as well. We'll begin with Heather's. It takes a very special individual to be able to look at a problem and try and figure out what needs to happen with that problem. That ability to understand the data and come up with a program that meets those needs that are reflected within that data or measures the success of those programs is critical. Um, I served for the City of Davenport's program and um, I spent about three years during college kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do as far as a career and I just kind of decided that public service was really what I wanted to do. So Heather's role in AmeriCorps has grown tremendously over the time that she's worked with us. She's been able to um, work with the grade level reading program. We provide academic reading tutors um, into the school buildings who work with kindergarten through fifth grade students who are struggling with literacy. It takes a very special person to be able to do that, to be able to take individuals, give them the information and training that they need to be able to impact the lives of our young people in different ways. As I've spent time with the city, I've kind of become more passionate about not just AmeriCorps and serving other people and service and volunteerism, um, but also local government and trying to help people with whatever it is that they need to be successful in life. Heather is a very compassionate individual. Um, whatever she takes on, um, she has the biggest, softest heart, but the strongest mind. I started read it, reading about settlement houses in the early 1900s and just 
how that was a place that if people had need, um, that they could go there. And settlement houses actually really impacted local government and what it could be and public administration um, in general, whether that's nonprofit or government itself. And we really refer to her as our resident data nerd. She's the one that goes out and looks at what does the data say? And then out of that, she looks at what can we do about that? How can we take that and use that data to help us come up with the best programs? We're going to have some new positions that are just trying to make community change and address the needs that happen. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. When I think of Heather, that's what I think of. She's that committed citizen and she is working to change the world. Telegraph Herald, I'm very pleased to recognize Heather Satterley as one of our 2022 Rising Star Award recipients. Thank you. <laughs> You're going to choose now to be shy in that microphone? I've, I've heard you talk in that microphone for hours at a time, Heather. Yes. That's because I have to talk about myself now, and I can talk about program all the time. Um, but I, I do appreciate um, being able to be here in the award and for me, or for Marie, for nominating me, um, and really just for the opportunity to serve this community and being a part of local government and honestly being surrounded by, I think, some of the most impactful people um, that we have here in the city. I couldn't do it without my team, so any recognition for me is truly recognition for them. So thank you. Well, you, you do amazing work, so thank you so much for the work that you do, and you totally deserve this award as well. Our next award recipient is Temwa Firi. If you want something done and you put Temwa on it, he's gonna be successful. That was demonstrated when he was at the Dancing with the Stars event. And when he did that backflip with Joanna as his partner, we knew right then that they had the competition nailed. I met uh, Temwa when he was a school connector and he was helping high school dropouts get reconnected with their education. We were talking about poverty in our community and he was walking around and we were looking at the data together to try and reflect on what it meant and how it was impacting our community. We were fortunate enough that somewhere along that path he uh, decided he'd come to work for the city of Dubuque. The path kind of started with my uh, with my family. I've always been uh, around my mom and just watched her how she was so involved, in, not only in the church but with uh, the community as well. The relationships that she was building uh, made an impact for me that I just wanted to be able to do the same. One thing Temo was really interested in is what data we had that we could share with them to learn more about the population that we serve so that it would enable him to do his job better and more effectively. He was really interested in making a difference and a change in our community, taking in that information and then sharing it out to other people so that we together could make a difference. Tem was in charge of what we call our City Life program. And so it's an effort for us to bring residents uh, into a better understanding about how they can impact their, their civic life. As the community engagement coordinator, one of the great things that we get to do with the Office of Shared Prosperity, our department, is actually uh, growing healthy and great relationships with other organizations, businesses, organizations that are impacting our community. And so what that looks like is just being able to convene with them and find out how can we actually help our community members uh, not only have access to the resources, but also be educated on those uh, resources on how they can actually help advance them forward. He's actually come up with a way to involve high school students in the program. And uh, it's really exciting when you get to engage in conversations with these young people that are looking to impact and change the world. He was driven and he was gonna find solutions to the, the, the challenges that we were both having. And immediately we saw traction being gained on many different issues around these patients. 
And, and it really came to fruition in terms of getting a position posted in, for a community health worker that would enable us to have the resources we need to really focus on the special populations where there are greater health disparities. I love the energy that Temwa brings to everything he does. Generosity, grace, patience, empathy, and really thinking deeply about how, I don't know, the situations and circumstances that affect us all can affect us in the moment and affect us out into the community. Tony Robbins has been huge. Uh, for me, I, I love the way that he disrupts the way that your, our thought processes are. <laughs> On behalf of the Telegraph Herald, I'm very excited to announce Tem Ferry as one of our 2022 award recipients for a rising star. Uh, yeah, I was not prepared to speak. I, thought, I was like, oh, yeah, videos, got it, boom, we're good, and I'll come up. Uh, but I, I just got to say uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I, I thank you for the nomination for uh, Mike, from Bobby, from Gary. Uh, again, couldn't be here without uh, the community, without uh, friends, family, the support. Again, this is... Um, this is, I don't know, I'm at a loss for words. I should probably just start dancing, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just grateful for this honor, for this opportunity. So thank you. All right. I love seeing such deserving people still be so humble in the face of all this. I, I see how challenging it is to talk about yourself in these moments, but you, you absolutely deserve this, and, and thank you so much for the work that you do, Tamwa, and that you both do. And thank you to the Telegraph Herald for, for presenting these awards in the community. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, what other fun do we have planned, Adrian? We will move on to proclamations. Our first proclamation is Days of Peace and Nonviolence. And I believe we have Richard Fisher here to accept this proclamation. Well, first of all, thank you for having our proclamation. My name's Richard Fisher, and I hail from Bernard, Iowa. Um, so I'm, it's always fun to visit Dubuque. I'm here probably Monday through Friday <laughs> uh, for doing various things in town, but. Um, the International Day of Peace is a, it's the 13th year we've put it together, and it's something that's dear to my heart. Uh, we were asked 13 years ago by several of the mother houses how they could take what was in-house to them out to the public. And uh, so myself and Art and a couple other people said, let's see what we can do. And now we um, are in our 13th year, and typically, We've ended up with 10 or 12 or 14 side events. Uh, we partnered with a great group of people, including NAACP, and it was fun this year to, to see us struggle to get back with them. Um, this is how um, DVQ barbecues, uh, both the, the threatening storm yesterday and the, um, I think the pandemic and other things kept our attendance down, but that's um, just a challenge to grow forward. Uh, yesterday, we also, or on Saturday, we also had a great hike in support of refugees and worked closely with them, Dubuque for ref refugee children, uh, raised some money for them, and also got to meet a lot of people. So uh, the downside, and as I, hopefully you've all got a, a brochure, um, I've been look so looking forward to having Jody Williams come and visit us. Uh, she won the Nobel Peace Prize for her work in uh, banning landmines worldwide and getting it passed through the UN and getting so many nations to come on board with that. And last Thursday we heard she can't come, to the, or she wasn't sure she could come, that she needed till she needed till she got back to her home to make a decision. She'd been, she'd been traveling. Uh, working on a variety of environmental issues. And um, on 3 o'clock on Sunday, she let us know that she could not come to Dubuque. And uh, we understood that it was going to be a problem with her. And uh, 
So thanks to the work of our committee, we, we hustled and we got a, what I think is going to be a great speaker. Uh, the city of Dubuque just hired him, I think, six months ago or something like that. So, so you know all about uh, Umaru Blades, and he's going to speak on the topic of how I got here and what I learned along the way. So he'll be our filling speaker um, for um, taking not Jody's place, but moving the whole idea of refugees and the need for a country like America to honor and, and embrace our refugees. So if any, without any questions, if anyone has questions or comments, did I forget anything, Rick? You did well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So, I think you covered it, and you do have a long list of events for this week, so thank you very much for all yeah, the work that you're doing and that every everybody's year, doing. So. Yeah, we're excited to have it, so thank you so much. Thank you. Well, City Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the issue of peace embraces the deepest hopes of all peoples and remains humanity's guiding inspiration, in 1981, the United Nations proclaimed the International Day of Peace be devoted to comm commemorating and strengthening the ideals of peace both within and among all nations and peoples. And whereas the United Nations expanded the observance of the International Day of Peace in 2001 to include the call for a day of global ceasefire and nonviolence, and invited all nations and people to honor a cessation of hostilities for the duration of the Day of Peace. And whereas there is growing support within our nation for the observance of the International Day of Peace, including a group of Dubuque area residents inviting all to create a culture of peace by participating in a citywide celebration from Saturday, September 17th to Tuesday, October 11th. And whereas, local and global violence impels everyone to work toward converting humanity's noblest aspirations for world peace into a practical reality. It is possible to see our community and world turn from violent to nonviolent solutions within our lifetimes. And whereas, the Dubuque Day of Peace Organizing Committee's 2022 focus will be environmental justice, a path to peace, with an in-person and virtual keynote presentation uh, on Wednesday, September 21st from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in the Alumni Campus Center at Loris College. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby recognize the United Nations International Day of Peace and proclaim the 17th of September through the 11th of October, 2022, as Days of Peace and Nonviolence in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and call upon the residents of Dubuque to further affirm a vision of our world at peace by fostering cooperation between individuals, organizations, and nations. You can come on up, Richard. Good job, my friend. Our second proclamation is Clean Energy Week. Okay, I see. Gina Bell and Michaela Freiberger, and, and Amanda Lewis. And Amanda Lewis, uh, thank you so much. Good evening, Mayor Kavanaugh and City Council. I'm Gina Bell, the City Sustainability Coordinator. I wanted to introduce you to our newest employee in the Office of Sustainability, Amanda Lewis. Um, she will be our Climate Action Coordinator. And so much of what her work will be doing is helping us find more renewable energy and clean energy opportunities for the city, and so I wanted to introduce her tonight. Um, I also think it's very auspicious that we're sharing uh, some of our week with um, the peace and nonviolence folks, because if I think about the future of climate change and impacts and refugees from across the world, um, a lot of this is being caused because of climate change. And so as we want to have a peaceful transition and a just transition to more clean energy, we have to be thinking about things like global peace, as well as clean energy. I'll stop there and let Michaela talk. Right. <laughs> thank you, Gina. And um, I'm going to go ahead and take my mask off. But um, I want to just first thank you all for your commitment in making a priority, putting forward the 50% by 2030 plan. Not only does that help our work at the Clean Energy District here in Dubuque County, but it helps promote all of our state partners that we collaborate with to really push forward um, not only what's happening and funneling down to our state level, but also what's happening at our federal level. So last week happened to be a really big release of a program called Justice 40, and 
it's interdepartmental at the federal level, but it was really focused in on promoting what we find here in Dubuque County um, to be 100% clean, efficient, and renewable energy by 2050, putting that at the forefront at our federal government level. And that 40 of the Justice 40 is 40% of the dollars that will be coming um, through the Department of Energy, whether it be at the federal government or at our state, will be to, towards disadvantaged communities and those who often are last on the energy transition. And I really want to thank Gina for her leadership on programs like our uh, Renew Dubuque program, which we kind of piloted in the county now is also saying, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do that throughout the county as well. And also promoting energy efficiency in many of our homes. We often um, engage with individuals who anecdotally will talk about their energy expenses and it's not a good picture right now. And so these kinds of efforts and these kinds of proclamations are great and I appreciate all of you showing up and to community events and engaging with not only your constituents but our neighbors as well as we talk um, more effectively about how public sectors can play a large role in not only our carbon reduction but also the green reduction and saving our dollars as well. So thank you very much for this proclamation. Well, thank you, Michaela, and thank you, Gina, for the work that you're both doing. And Amanda, welcome. Glad to have you here. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas across Dubuque, clean and readily abundant forms of energy power more homes and businesses than ever before. And whereas clean energy is part of Iowa's energy future. It includes generation from renewable sources such as wind, solar, hydro, and geothermal sources. But it also includes nuclear, natural gas, and carbon capture technologies, as well as energy storage. And whereas the clean energy sector is a growing part of the economy and has been a key driver of growth in Iowa in recent years, with over 28,000 Iowans currently employed in the clean energy sector. And whereas Iowa is the nation's largest fuel ethanol and biodiesel producer, accounting for one fourth of US fuel ethanol production capacity and one fifth of biodiesel manufacturing capacity. And whereas Dubuque prioritizes sustainability by addressing environmental and ecological integrity, economic prosperity, and social and cultural vibrancy. And whereas clean energy jobs cannot be outsourced due to the on-site nature of construction, installation, and maintenance, these jobs are inherently local and contribute to the growth of local economies. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the week of September 26th through 30th, 2022 as Clean Energy Week in the city of Dubuque, Iowa. This is the only pictures where I get to be tall. <laughs> Our next proclamation is Crop Walk Day in Dubuque. All right, and we have Sarah McCaw, I believe, yes. Good evening and thank you for this time. Uh, the Dubuque Area Crop Hunger Walk is sponsored by Dubuque Area Congregations United and it has been a part of the Dubuque community for over 40 years. Uh, to be honest, we can't remember how long exactly, but it's, well, I know it's over 40 because I walked when I was in high school. So that was a while ago. Uh, the Dubuque uh, Hunger or Crop Hunger Walk supports hunger um, causes all around the world. Our parent organization is Church World Service, and it's an ecumenical organization, and um, it has uh, self-help programs all around the world, hunger alleviation. It supports refugees around the world as well. But the good news is that 25% of the money that we raise, and we usually raise uh, between 15 and $20,000 every year through the crop walk, 25% um, stays here in Dubuque to support three local agencies, the Dubuque Food Pantry, the Dubuque Rescue Mission, and people in need. So uh, church people from all over the world, and we also have partner organizations uh, join in this walk. It takes place on Grandview Avenue on Saturday, October 1st in the morning. And so we hope that you will support it and we thank you for this proclamation. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for your work and for being here and being a part of this from the early days, it sounds. So thank you. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas since 1946, Crop and Church World Service has had walks to collect funds to alleviate hunger overseas and in the United States. And whereas Crop Walk pledges now meet human need in over 70 countries with disaster and emergency response, refugee and immigrant services, and economic and social upheaval response. 
And whereas Dubuque Rescue Mission, Dubuque Food Pantry, and people in need each will equally share the 25% retained locally of the total amount collected. And whereas Dubuque Annual Crop Walk will take place Saturday, October 1st, 2022, starting at St. Elias the Prophet Church located at 419 North Grandview Avenue, proceeding to the Grandview Green Space on the corner of South Grandview Avenue and Rockdale Road, then returning to the point of origin to help our community become aware of and concerned about how hunger affects us all. And whereas the Crop Walk will raise funds to help stop hunger both locally and globally. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim Saturday, October 1st, 2022, as Crop Walk Day in Dubuque, and urge the residents of Dubuque to participate with the Dubuque Area Congregations United to support this walk. Our final proclamation is the inaugural Dubuque Night of Lights. Okay. Let's see, we have John Donovan, Wes Heitzman, and Jelaine Pinchuk here. Hello, greetings. Hello. I'm Jelaine Pinchuk. This is Wes, Wes Heitzman. And we are with Bluff Strokes. Uh, uh, this will be our delayed fifth year of our Bluff Strokes event. Um, for those who don't know, it is where 60 artists will paint for one week in Dubuque. Um, this year we have 50 or um, 57 artists from outside of, the, outside of the community and three local artists participating. Um, we have had great success in the past, um, highlighting the importance of not only pride in your community, but support of the arts and how much that has an impact on the people who live in the community, as well as our own enjoyment of art within our own homes. So um, we have had, let's see, our last event, we sold over $100,000 of original art that is now mostly in Dubuque area homes and businesses. So we're very, very excited to have it back again this year after a two-year delay. And this event on the October 4th will actually be our nocturne. So our artists arrive on Sunday, October 2nd, and that's when they register at Steeple Square have their canvases stamped and head out into the fields or the, by the riverfront or in the historic downtown to start their paintings. On Tuesday is our official nocturne event where the artists are allowed to paint one painting starting at 5 p.m. and submit that the next morning. So it's gonna be a very exciting evening where 60 artists are going to be mainly downtown painting the, the electric lights, the reflections off the Mississippi River, and then submitting those um, the next day. Want to jump in? Yeah, I would just like to add that this, this effort really grew out of a great love for Dubuque and all of our old buildings, landscapes, neighborhoods, nooks and crannies and alleys. And this is a way to, for us to get to see Dubuque the way an artist might see it, which may be different than the way we're normally seeing it. So I would really encourage everybody to come down uh, Friday night or Saturday night. Friday is a patron event, so there is a fee involved. Saturday is an all-day public event. Um, and I would just say the images can be powerful. Uh, the very first show, we had a young woman walk into the show, and she looked at all the art, and she said, I have never been to an art opening before. I didn't know it would make me cry. So it, there's a lot to this in terms of, of emotional impact of what we do and what we share with these artists. So Wes and I come from slightly different perspectives. Um, I am relatively new to Dubuque, been here for 15 years when Hirschbach moved their headquarters to Dubuque. I was blown away. So I'm from Minneapolis. I was blown away by the parks we have here, by the downtown and how much has been restored and really celebrated. And so from an outsider's perspective, 
similar to the artists coming in, they're like kids in the candy store. They are so excited to be able to paint all around Dubuque. And in, no matter what their subject matter is, whether it's rural or um, farm scenes or downtown or you know boats and working river, all of that, we've got it all, which is really unique. And it's something that I think those of us who live here now need to, need to recognize and celebrate. Um, it also creates one of the best weeks ever. It's, it's like the whole city just kind of, you know, stands up a little bit straighter because we are worthy of being painted and we need to know that. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. That was just so well said. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll start cool. it this way. All right, and thank you for this great addition to this event too with the inaugural Night of Light. So, City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas 2022 is the fifth year for the Bluff Strokes Plain Air Paint Out in Dubuque, Iowa, and whereas 60 artists from 10 states will come to Dubuque for Bluff Strokes Plain Air Paint Out from Sunday, October 2nd through Saturday, October 8th, and whereas Tuesday, October 4th is the evening set aside for their Nocturne Paint Out, and whereas the Dubuque Camera Club and the Dubuque Urban Sketchers will also participate in the Nocturne event. And whereas, to create a spectacular downtown atmosphere for artists to paint, sketch, or photograph, all downtown businesses and institutions between the Julian Dubuque Bridge and 18th Street and between the Mississippi River and Bluff Street are requested to leave their interior and exterior lights on to light up downtown. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 4th of October, 2022, as the inaugural Dubuque Night of Lights in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. All right, Adrian. We will now move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through five of the agenda. All right, thank you, Adrian. We have anyone who would like to hold any of the consent items for separate discussion? Seeing no one here, do we have anyone virtual? Nope. Okay, bring it back to the table then. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. And a motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have four. First is 2022 John F. Kennedy Road Sidewalk Installation Project for October 3rd, 2022. Second is Park and Recreation Advisory Commission Member Re Removal Recommendation for October 3rd, 2022. Third is Approving Assignment of a Development Agreement between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and Novelty Iron Landlord LLC to the Hotel Dubuque LLC and setting a hearing to approve a Sixth Amendment to a Development Agreement between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and the Hotel Dubuque LLC for October 3rd, 2022 and resolution of intent to create Bees Drive Urban Revitalization Area and setting public hearing for November 7th, 2022. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates and times specified. Second by Sprank. Motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have applicant review for the Civil Service Commission, the Community Development Advisory Commission, and the Housing Commission. Thank you, Adrian. 
Our first up is the Civil Service Commission. We have one four-year term through April 6, 2026, and two applicants, Scott Crable and Michelle Hinkey. Do we have anyone here in the chambers to address us on either of these? Yeah, come on up. Mr. Mayor, City Council, thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Crable. I reside at 2757 Balboa Drive. I might be a familiar face. Um, I just retired from the police department after 36 and a half years of service as a captain. And I thought what way to stay involved is to maybe look at uh, being involved in the city in the, in, in this commission. Part of my job as a police captain was our recruiting and testing. So I worked very close with the Civil Service Commission and with our Human Resources Department and getting those lists certified and getting those people on the police department. So that's my, my, that's my brief spill. I appreciate your time. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think, I think we're good. Thank okay. you very much, Th Captain Thank Craven. you very much. Have a good evening. Appreciate you being here. Yep. Do we have anyone else to address on either of these? Then oh, I should ask virtually. Is there anyone? No one virtually. Okay. Thank you. Then I'll move on to the Community Development Advisory Commission. We have one three-year term through February 13th, 2024, and one applicant, um, Gerald Hamill. Do have anyone to address us on this applicant? Anyone virtually? No one virtually. Okay. Moving on then to the Housing Commission, we have one three-year term through August 17th, 2025, and one applicant, Kathy Dickens. Anyone to address us on this application? And, and no one virtually. All right. Then we can move on. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is 4400 Asbury Road rezoning request. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed to be suspended. I'll second. So we got a motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Wally, please. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Wally Wormont, Planning Services Manager. Um, the request before you is, to, is a proposal to rezone a portion of Sam's Club's property from PC Plant Commercial to AG Agricultural. Um, the reason for it is for an expansion of an existing substation that's located on the property. So one question I ask is, why is the substation zoned ag at that location? Well, the sub substation existed before Sam's Club was located there. And when they came through and rezoned the property, they rezoned the plan unit development around that piece of property. And in that plan unit development, substations are not a permitted use. So therefore, for them, in order for them to expand, they have to rezone that portion of that PUD to ag. Uh, it will take over a 20 space parking lot area of Sam's Club, um, but uh, based on the current parking requirements uh, for Sam's Club, they, they well exceed the required amount of Boston Street parking for that property. So the, the request is pretty much simple, just to rezone a portion of that property to allow that expansion um, for that powers, um, power substation. So the Zoning Advisor Commission held a public hearing. Um, there was no one who spoke in opposition to the request. Staff gave the staff report providing a lot of the information that's included in your packet. Um, by, uh, by a vote of five to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends the City Council approve the request and a simple majority vote is needed for City Council to approve this request. That's all I have unless you guys have any, any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of a request from Interstate Power and Light Company, uh, Mary Montgomery, to rezone a portion of the property located at 4400 Asbury Road from PC Plan Commercial to AG Agriculture, and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone here to address us on this item? Anyone virtually? No virtual input. All right. I'll bring it back to the table then for any questions or discussion. Ms. Farber. Just a quick question for Wally. You had said that there was um, no one that uh, contested this. What about Sam's Club? Did they have Actually, an opinion? Um, they're selling the property, so they're kind of happy that they're, I guess they're just working with them because, yeah, they're the landowner, so they're, they're in agreement with it. So. Okay. Thank you for that yep. clarification. Any others? Yeah, Mr. Johnson. 
Not too many things come to us that are really no-brainers, and this is, this is one with uh, <laughs> more and more of a shift towards electricity as a source of energy and more and more of a shift towards clean production of electricity. Um, distributing is going to be very, very important, and it's critically important to this community, so making sure that we're up to date um, with that ability is, uh, is a community interest by far, and I'm glad Sam's a solid property. I'm glad nobody's objecting, and I'm glad we're going to pass this. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right. Seeing no others, thank you, Wally. Appreciate you being here for this one. You bet. So we have a motion by Jones and a second by Roussel to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move final consideration and pass it to the ordinance. Second. We got a motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number two is amend the Unified Development Code to omit specific requirements within Article 16-11-7E. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Farber. And a motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Coming back to you, Wally. Yes. All right. Once again, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Wally Wernermont, Planning Services Manager. Um, so the request before you uh, tonight is a text amendment. Um, the Unified Development Code is being amended because we're being preempted by state law with regards to pre-annexation agreements that are tied specifically to subdivisions of land. So currently the city of Dubuque has the ability to review subdivision plats within two miles of our jurisdiction. Um, as part of the, uh, the state um, bill or Senate bill that was being discussed, there was a lot of discussion with regards to properties located in the county um, where a county doesn't have county zoning requirements. Um, the Dubuque County does have a zoning ordinance, so they have the authority to review zoning in our two mile area. However, we do review subdivision plats. And as part of those subdivision plats review, we typically required as part of our fringe area agreement, which is what we use for plan and managed growth. Um, that's the area where our community is growing. Um, we require pre-annexation agreements um, as a condition of uh, reviewing plats. Um, currently, we, you'll, you just approved tonight two pre-annexation agreements, um, that, but those were tied to agreements for water. Um, the state law does not preempt us from requiring pre-annexation agreements for connection to public utilities or any other specific agreements. Um, however, based on the state law, it does preempt us from requiring those pre-annexation agreements for subdivisions of land for that. So um, we're amending the tech, we're amending the Unified Development Code. Uh, this text memo was taken before the Zoning Advisory Commission as part of a public hearing. Um, they held, they heard that case. Um, there was no public input at the meeting. And by a vote of five to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends the City Council approve the text amendment request and a simple majority vote is needed for city council to approve the request. Available to answer any questions that you may have. So, Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider the city council approval of a request from the city of Dubuque to amend the Unified Development Code to omit specific requirements within Article 16-11-7E in order to comply with a newly enacted state law, Senate File 2285, and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone in the chambers to comment on this or address us? How about virtually? No one virtually. All right, I'll bring it back to the table then for any discussion or questions. So if we vote against this, can we stop the state from preempting us on something? <laughs> um, I'll shoot that one your direction, I'm guessing no. I wish. Yeah. I'd sure love to stop hearing the word preemption every time we get together anymore. It just seems like it's happening an awful, awful lot these days. And it comes yeah. from my mouth quite a bit, because typically it's, it's a lot of them are tied to the Unified Development Code or zoning laws. Yeah. So, yes, unfortunately, I'm a barrier of bad news sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, we are not uh, against going with state law you know, normally as we do this. But, yeah, Mr. Resnick. Quick question. So how does this affect us uh, specifically? We were asking for uh, agreements for uh, the entire, um, uh, you know, the whole uh, subdivision before, and now we can't do it. Is that... Is Correct, it? yeah. As is, uh, prior to approving of the plat, they would submit a pre-annexation agreement. Um, that agreement actually outlines proration of property tax. So 
Um, in the future, if they were annexed into the city, because most of these properties are not located contiguous to the city of Dubuque. Um, it's for future growth, and then when they were to be annexed into the city, um, there's a proration of property taxes that are associated with it. Um, we were requiring these pre-annexations. Um, we can't require them, we can request. So when I get an application that comes in there within two miles, um, our zoning advisory commission will still review those plats, or if it's a simple subdivision, I can sign off on that. You will not, that does not necessarily have to come before you um, for those simple subdivisions. Um, I will be informing them that I would request they could fill out, uh, apply for a pre-annexation agreement, but they're not required. And, and again, this just relates to the simple subdivisions. So for example, if we offer services and things of that nature, we can still require them as a condition of extending our, the services that the city of Dubuque offers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that, is that going to affect us a lot? Maybe because our services are often uh, part of the deal, so. Right. Um, you know, we have quite a few acres that are signed these pre-annexation agreements. Um, but for our services for public utilities being extended, um, we do have them continue to sign those. Uh, quite a few of those are actually located in existing subdivisions that are asking for our water. But as we grow and we look at, for instance, an adjoining property, um, they may want to subdivide. Um, in those cases, when we do look at, say, for instance, doing an annexation, um, we, would go, we would go to them and request if they would like to be annexed. Um, we'd have discussions with regards to an 80-20 annexation or 100% annexation. Um, there's a lot of, um, to explain between those two annexations. Uh, I don't think we have enough time in the meeting, but, um, but just to, to help explain that uh, the annexations for these, you know, it does help us with our plan and manage group with the city, so. Thank you for your help yep. with those answers. Mr. Mayor? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Wally, for your work on this and for being here tonight. So we have a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then City staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. We have any public input in chambers this evening? Seeing none, any virtual input? No virtual input. Okay. Going once, going twice. No public input. Thank you very much. We can move on, Adrian. We will move on to action items. Action item number one is approval grant for the Dubuque Dream Center's acquisition of 2540 Central Avenue Fulton School. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I would motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. And a motion by Sprank and a second by Jones. Crenna, please. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council approval of a resolution approving a grant agreement by and between the City of Dubuque and Dubuque Dream Center for the purchase and rehabilitation of the former Fulton School Building located at 2540 Central Avenue and utilizing the building to provide its regular programming. The City Manager concurs with the recommendation and respectfully requests Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Krenna. Any questions or discussion? Mr. Sprank. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I'm in full support of this. Being that the building is only a couple blocks from my house, um, I'm glad to see that it's not going to go to waste. It's not going to be sitting idle. Um, these funds will help double, if not quadruple, what the services that the Dream Center can do, which can mainly support a lot of kids in my neighborhood, as well as uh, Miss Wethel's neighborhood. So I'm very glad that, that we're, hopefully we're all going to agree on this tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strang. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Uh, I would like to thank the school board for all their good work with this. And uh, um, 
you know, they, they have some difficult issues as we do. And uh, so they really considered this. And I think they came up with a, um, a great answer of yes. And, uh, and lately, I've, I've, I've listened to the council, uh, the uh, school board members, and they've talked about the quality of, of offerings at the, at the Dubuque Dream Center as one of the main reasons that they're agreeing to this. And uh, I couldn't agree more. I think we all agree that uh, it's such a valuable as, uh, asset to our community. So I, again, I would like to thank the school board uh, for their vision on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, you look like you're going to say something, Mr. Jones. That's okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm excited to see this moving forward as well. You know, obviously we've uh, you know we've we've voiced our support for for this item in the past, and uh, now that we've we have the chance to be able to move this forward, so I'm excited to vote for this. So we do have a motion by Mr. Sprank and a second by Mr. Jones to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Motion passes seven zero. Action item number two is smart parking mobility update. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and view the presentation. Second by Farber. A motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Um, am I going straight to you, Ryan? I hope so. A memo that says that Ryan is going to provide an update and presentation. Thank you very much, Krenna. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ryan Naki, Director of Transportation Services. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council. City Clerk and City Attorney, thank you very much for that, Krenna. It's wonderful. Um, I come to you tonight not to ask for money. I am coming to ask for your help. Um, you, the City Council approved a smart parking study and mobility study for the City of Dubuque. Let me get back to my beginning slides here. And I want to make sure that we are updating you as we go through this study. Um, I don't want it to come out, me come to you in a year and tell you, hey, this is what we did, this is what we need. I want to stand here and ask for your help as, as we go through this. Um, so we came to City Council um, to ask to, to do a study throughout Dubuque. We were looking at a new smart parking system. Okay, so our current systems, we have seven ramps. I have three different technology systems in the ramps, and I have one of those systems that is obsolete. We literally are using duct tape and fishing wire to keep it going. Um, so. This started out, we wanted a new parking system, we threw mobility into it. Uh, mobility doesn't just mean walking and biking, we're looking at how people travel throughout Dubuque. And throughout this study, we're gonna be looking at that in different ways on, on how to improve what we do. So initially, we're looking how do we improve Dubuque, not for just this year, but for the next 10 to 15 years. Because we know how today works with how techni technology advances, we're looking at what's it gonna look like in 10 and 15 years. Um, so we were approved to, put an RFP out to hire a consultant. We hired Walter, or Walker Consulting, sorry. Um, and they also brought along with them RGD, or RDG Planning and Design along with Bolton and Mank. Both of these companies have worked in Dubuque before, know the land, the land pretty well, so we're very excited to have them come along with Walker. Um, so what we've been doing with the partners that we're working with now is we're showing them what Dubuque has currently, okay? so. We're collecting data with what we do today. Um, last week we had uh, Walker Consulting here. We took them through the parking ramps. We showed them all surface lots. We drove through the 2,000 meters on street parking spaces so they can see what we currently have. Um, they can't tell us what we can possibly get until they know what we actually do and we have. So last week we sat down with them, went through all this data. Um, it was a very good week. We're still collecting data. They have cameras up there. We're still collecting data and taking uh, numbers just so we can keep an adequate, adequate count of what we're doing. To collect this data, we're gonna move into some key things that we're looking to do. Um, we're gonna evaluate the needs and issues of opportunity related to how we move forward within Dubuque. Again, this isn't for today, this is for the next 10 to 15 years we're looking at. Um, the help I'm asking for is we wanna engage a broad and diverse community of stakeholders. Um, we have our stakeholder groups and we're meeting currently. Um, right now, most of our groups are uh, city employees because we're teaching them, hey, this is the technology we have. These are the staff members that run it. This is the parking enforcement officers and this is their jobs so that our consultants can see, hey, this is how the operation runs today. Um, we're gonna assess our current mobility and use and behavior. Again, this isn't just about parking technology. This is about 
walking and biking, tourism, um, how, how people move throughout downtown Dubuque especially. Um, we're going to evaluate the systems, finances, technology, operations, and management. Um, we just started digging into today, you know, what are the finances, finances look like? Um, what's our expenses for the ramps? You know, how much does it take to cost us to run all these meters every year? Um, this will play a big part into what we move forward with long term. Um, and then we're definitely going to address uh, equity and evaluate how walking, bicycling, and transit integrated with the system as a whole. My division, we run parking and the transit division. So we're bringing all of our dual bus routes into this. Are they in the right spots? Are we moving them correctly? Do we need to move bus stops down the block two blocks? These are things we want to evaluate to make sure that we're making the correct decisions as we move forward. Some other key points that we're looking at is we want to identify how to access park and mobility systems to best serve residents, visitors, and businesses. Um, Dubuque's starting to bring a lot more, I mean, we have the Viking Cruises coming to town. So how does that move in throughout Dubuque? We're trying to look at all the different aspects of what does move through downtown. Uh, envision future scenarios for downtown and the future of access and mobility. Uh, we want to provide a we're, we're going to provide system recommendations. Um, I don't plan on coming back to you saying, hey, this is what we're going to buy. Um, I'd like to definitely talk to you guys again and say, hey, this is what's out there. This is where, uh, what we're looking at right now. Um, we're going to develop a plan for ongoing parking and transportation. Um, it's not going to stop here. We'll have a big, thick binder of, hey, this is what we're doing today. This is where we can move to over the next couple of years. Uh, we want to right size our parking inventory. We have 2,000 metered spaces. Do we need that many metered spaces? Do we need our residential parking districts? We're evaluating that route right now. We're looking at pros and cons of having it there. Um, and then we're going to set the stage. Again, this is for 10 and 15 years down the road. We want to build our plan, look at the technology, implement technology, and then move forward with it. So with that, we're working on our project schedule and process right now. Um, I want to stress, we're collecting a ton of data from the city systems right now. So if you have people asking you, hey, how come nobody's reaching out about the smart park and mobility plan, we're not there yet. We're still teaching our consultant teams of what we do currently today. So when they get um, confronted by someone else asking about what we can do in future state, they can relate to them what they see today to, hey, this could be a possibility, future state. So right now we're in data collection and we're doing a condition assessment of what we're going to work with. Um, as we move through September, October, definitely in October we're going to have a lot more stakeholder engagement, a lot more public engagement. Um, and then we're going to get to November where we should have, this is what we do today, this is what we're he hearing we want to do tomorrow. So we'll start to develop scenarios on, hey, this is something we could do. And that's what I want to come back to you guys with to say, hey, this is what we know we do today, this is what we're going to do hopefully future state. I'm not going to come back and say this is what we will do. These are options that we will have. Um, and then as we move into next year, we're going to look at building that plan for us. We're going to have that plan saying, here's what our parking looks like today. This is what we want to look like tomorrow. Same with mobility. We're going to say, hey, here's our bike trails today. This is what they're going to look like tomorrow. Um, and then future state, we're going to have, how do we implement all this technology? Um, this is all the way out into March, July of next year. So this is something we're taking our time, making sure we're getting all the data we can get. Um, now we're going to start engaging more people so we can get more data brought in. Um, and there's different ways that we're going to do that. And that's why I'm really excited that Walker, Tech, or Walker Consultants brought in RDG and Bolton and Mink. We've been able to bounce a lot of ideas off each other already. Um, just going through the parking ramps, it was amazing. As we're driving through there, I filled up probably half a notepad worth of ideas. We're looking at, hey, these are reserved, these are not reserved, hey, these are open for people to use. Um, it, it was a real nice eye-opener, and it was each different company looking at us saying, this is what I think you should do. Um, and then they would say, this is what we did in Omaha or in Minneapolis. Or they had backstories to why they like to do that. So what we're doing right now is we're doing weekly standing calls. Every week we're on the phone with them. They're asking us for data and clarifying data. We're asking them what we should be doing next. Um, then we do bi-weekly calls with our technical committee, and that committee is more how are we going to reach out to the, to the city and to the businesses around the area. Um, we're trying to figure out how we're going to brand this. Um, coming up, we're going, uh, I'm sorry, the last week, September 12th, we did have Walker and Bolton and Mink in Dubuque. Um, RDG was also here. Uh, we did the, the ramp assessments. We did the parking um, meter assessments along with the parking lots. 
Um, it was a very good week, like I said. A lot of ideas were bounced off each other. And they were very fascinated with our downtown. They're like, well, this is, this is neat how it works. You have pretty much a whole street of, of ramps that we could really intertwine and make this work really well. Um, another thing that they looked at is um, some of the bicycling and walking condition assessment, which that'll come future state more. Um, data inf information systems, they were asking what type of technology we're on today, and we were telling them, and they were looking at us saying, well, that's obsolete. I'm like, yeah, well, we run it. I said, we still make it work. So they're very excited because they know we can keep systems going, and, and we have the drive to do that. Um, Oct October is going to be a big month for us. Um, we're going to start engaging a lot more stakeholders. Um, and in October, we should have our branding complete. And once our branding is complete, there will be a website set up that we're going to be able to have people go to to do surveys. Tell us what's good. Tell us what you like. Tell, tell us what you don't like, because that's really what we want to solve if we can't. But we're going to get it out there so everybody gets to have communication into this if they, if they want to. Um, that's when we'll be definitely working with advisory groups of business owners, of key citizens, um, and definitely looking at the surveys and what they're telling us as we move forward. Um, October 13th, we're going to have a table at the Millwork Night Market. Um, it's going to work really well. We're going to try and get this out to the public as much as we can. We want input. We want everybody in to come up, say hi. We'll have a, a set of data that we want them to talk to us about. Um, and then they can ask us questions about what we're doing and where we're going with this. And then on October 14th, um, Steve Sampson Brown will be doing a community bike ride. Um, and this will be great. This is going to be literally taking the consultants along with the community on a bike ride, and we're going to look at what works well, what doesn't work well, what's a safety issue on, these, on our bike trails, how do we improve this. Um, I want to be very clear that we can't fix everything at once. Um, I have parking ramps that are at the top of my priority, but there's other, some low, there's other low hanging fruit that we can look at also as we move forward. And then we're going to roll into November and we're going to be working on some workshops with everybody to make sure that we're collecting this data and putting it together in a um, form that we can easily present to other people. And with that, that is my short, quick update. Um, what I do ask, though, is as you guys get questions and concerns, um, currently, just tell everybody that, hey, we're working on getting a website up. Um, we're, we're still doing the back work right now. Once we get the branding up, I'll be coming back saying, hey, here's, our, here's where we want you to go, um, or we'll get it on the, the agenda sometime so that way everybody knows where they can go to put their input in. And with that, any questions for me? Thank you very much, Ryan. Mr. Mr. Jones. Just, just a thought as you're uh, looking for stakeholder input, um, perhaps the, you could develop a small card that says in big letters, not a ticket, <laughs> and have the meter checkers and others distribute them as you would parking tickets throughout downtown to random cars parked here and there. And please, please click on our website or go to this QR code and, and help us answer a few questions to design how to do this tomorrow because I, I think you can gather a lot of people that way. We had a lot of success with, the, with community um, engagement with our um, comprehensive plan by being everywhere. And you've, you've kind of got a little bit of the market cornered. You know, you can print something on the back of the tickets coming out of the spitters as people enter the ramps that uh, steer you towards that website. A lot, of, a lot of things like that. And then there's some established groups that are, that are probably obvious to you, and I bet they're on your list, but uh, we've got a thriving Main Street organization that engages a lot of the merchants and their interests. We've got, of course, the Chamber of Commerce, Greater Dubuque. Um, but uh, being at farmer's market and events like you're talking about are you're going to find a lot of people where it's going to matter. So thank you. I'm pretty thank excited you. about this. Mr. Mayor? Uh, Mr. Resnick. Thank you. And um, so this is a perfect timing. I was going to include this in, in uh, my uh, council member report. Ms. Wethel and I were both at a, a Complete Streets event on last Friday, sponsored by Co-op, uh, pardon me, Coop, Bicycle Coop. And, and of course, uh, you know, uh, we had so many wonderful people there. It was like 50 different bicyclists who came down and um, it was also sponsored by our sustainability department. And they, they stressed, it's not just planes, trains, and automobiles around here. We have to be very careful and uh, cognizant to put in you know, bicyclists and the special needs that they have and get used to um, 
uh, people in Dubuque seeing bicyclists mm -hmm. and to be uh, not scared but respectful and uh, of the, another form of transportation that's so important uh, to so many people. Uh, so I'm sure you're going to uh, speak, the consultants are going to speak with the COOP uh, folks. They, uh, again, have a great idea. Um, you know, we talked about this at uh, uh, somewhat at our goals and priority session, talking about complete streets and maybe some specific projects to, to move those along. Uh, but I think we are coming to the... Um, a way to beat the bluffs, which is the big impediment for a lot of people here in Dubuque and for people coming downtown and back up, you know, they're just, how do we get them? Electrical e-bikes are, are uh, one possibility. Uh, someone, someone from the coop mentioned that maybe a little trolley uh, during at one spot between two, you know, uh, east-west corridors. There's no bicycle lanes in the east-west corridor. They've got a lot of great ideas. I'm sure you'll hear a lot more. But I appreciate this, and uh, I was just over in England and Ireland, and they are biking like crazy over there. It's a lot flatter here, I mean, there than it is here. But um, they're out there when there's that opportunity uh, to to bike, and it's not just people uh, inspire, you know, it's, you know, all dressed up in, in bike gear. It's folks who want to get places and do things, see people get together and uh, use their bike to do it. So I appreciate you uh, reaching out. I will be looking forward to some of the ideas that you have. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Mayor. Ms. Barber. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. And you probably know where I'm going to ask questions about are going to be the electric vehicles. And if you're looking at charging stations um, and how that would work in terms of the mobility, how the city could be charging for those. Uh, stations uh, where they would be uh, and to make it accessible throughout the city because there are many people that you know come into Dubuque for the day perhaps on their EV uh, and are looking for a charge so uh, hopefully that's part of uh, the uh, research charging stations have been something we've talked about we've gone through and kind of shown where we have them currently in the city um, that's a discussion that did come up on how do we improve this if we can well we can improve it for sure but um, yeah. Where, where can we put them? And this is something we'll, we'll definitely have in the plan. Yeah, and I'd be curious just to know how other um, cities or other areas are um, charging for the charging stations because that is an alternative source of revenue uh, to basically offset some of the gas tax that we would be receiving in lieu of um, mm -hmm. the charging. So thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Yeah, just a footnote for that. You know, it's, it's a buck an hour to park. It's five bucks an hour to park and charge, whatever. There's, there's a way to turn that into a revenue stream for sure and provide a, a needed service. Ms. Bethel. Yeah. Um, on the complete streets ride, uh, I'm not nearly the bicyclist as Mr. Resnick, but I had a lot of fun. And I learned a lot about um, Rob Williams uh, referred to it also as low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Things like when a bike, especially down at B Branch, so there is clear markings on cement as to where a bike should cross the road. But if we add things like flashing lights, it's low hanging fruit. It doesn't, you know, you can hook those up to something solar and they can run themselves. And so just little things for safety. And a big thing that I took away from it is um, the bike coop's goal of having kids on the streets yeah. with their bikes. <coughs> Who can argue with that? We've got to make it safe, though. And so I hope that as the consultants give space to, yes, parking, yes, adult transportation, but I hope that transportation for children to get them outside and walking and the on bike paths. And I just want to make sure that we don't miss that opportunity through all this. Thank you for the input. got a follow-up question to Ms. Wethel's points because, um, you know, um, the the signage and things like that normally fall with engineering, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, engineering. So how does this connect with, you know, because all these things are connected. I mean, the signage is connected to the parking, to the mobility. I mean, when you say mobility, you're talking about lots of different departments within the city. So I'm just curious how that's working with, is this solely in your department? Oh, no. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, Steve Sampson Brown's here tonight also. Engineering, um, Steve and I are both heading this up. So as we have these conversations, Steve's like, well, that's an engineering question. I'll, I'll take that one. 
that's on my side, I take those. Um, and then on our technical meetings, we have um, different people from the city that are answering a lot of these questions already that we're looking at. Excellent. But this, this is the input I'm looking for, definitely. Great. So that way, when Mr. I go back. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Hey, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. I, I do want to be a little careful here. Um, this study is designed to be a smarter transportation study around the, our parking system and our transit system. While there'll be some tangential uh, connection components that uh, maybe were mentioned tonight, I think we have to be careful. This is not a complete street study and uh, how we're going to change the configuration of our streets and uh, make them all more bike friendly and all those kinds of things. That's way beyond the scope of this. Now, as I said, there may be some tangential connections between certain places that deal with our parking system and our transit system, but it, I don't want people to get expectations way beyond the scope of the study and then be disappointed that why isn't that addressed in the study? Well, because it we didn't hire this firm or pay a contract big enough for that to happen. Got it. Thank you, Mike. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves necessarily, we want to make sure we're focused on the area where we need to be focused, and we appreciate that reminder. Um, but this still, e even with that said, um, the scope is still is still pretty large. I mean, this is actually incredibly helpful. I, I know for me, this was a, a really helpful presentation, uh, and I, I really appreciate you coming and giving us this reminder about what's going on, and giving us an update on how things are going, because this is a question that people are asking. You know, I mean, we, we've been talking about parking and uh, the mobility in the study for a couple of years now, and I know that there were some delays in there with the pandemic, but we've been talking about it for a while. So this is a good update for us to receive. So thank you very much. And anything else before we move along? All right, Ryan. Well, thank you very much thank for your you time tonight. Much. All right. Well, we have a motion by Roussel, second by Farber to receive and file here that presentation. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. And passes 7 0. Action item number three is Travel Dubuque Upper Midwest Convention and Visitors Bureau Innovation Award video. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move that we receive and file and view the video and a couple comments once we get a second. All right. Second by Sprank. All right. We have a motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Um, do you want the comments before or after the video? Uh, this, this is kind of a neat video. This is the video that they took to this conference of, of uh, Midwest, uh, what is it? Upper Midwest. Upper Canadian. Midwest mm -hmm. um, Convention and Visitor Bureau's <laughs> conference. And it highlighted what we've done. And of course, uh, our CVB has dealt with the Field of Dreams in Major League Baseball. Nobody else's has, so we already won before we left. <laughs> but this video is pretty spectacular, and I just want you to know um, that it's produced locally in-house by the team at Travel Dubuque, as is most of the material that comes out of there, the print material, the web material, the, the uh, digital material, and it's, uh, it's reflective of the quality of work that happens there every single day, and I'm proud to represent this body on that board. Thank you, Mr. Jones. With that, we can go ahead and roll the video, please. Well, I've been involved with the field ever since the uh, Field of Dreams, ever since the movie was released in April of 1989. I actually uh, lived, have lived in that area most of my adult life. So I was there when the movie was filmed in the summer of 1988. And then when it was released in theaters of uh, April and people started coming just like they said in the movie, I started to uh, go over and help my neighbors with various aspects of the upkeep of the diamond. Uh, with that being said, all the events that were done there through the years, both minor and major, I pretty much had a hand in, also managed the field for 14 years. And uh, so I've been uh, in, you know, very much entwined with the field of dreams ever since the beginning. You know, we always, you know, you always have in the back of your mind how unique it would be to have Major League Baseball be involved with the field. The excitement around the announcement, the excitement around the potential game is something I've never seen before. You know, we, everybody, and you know, people were gonna come, you know, even if they didn't get tickets to the game, they were gonna be in the area. So with that, we decided we wanted to create a festival around it, much like we've done in the past with various events. So we looked at partnering with, you know, you know our 
everybody in Dubuque, Dubuque County, Dyersville. So what we could create for things for people to do that are coming that had tickets and things for people to do that didn't have tickets. So we did create this festival, this uh, three-day festival called Beyond the Game and uh, had a variety of different things for people to see and do when they were in the area. We had a viewing party on the Thursday night of the actual game for people once again that were in the area that you know couldn't get tickets but wanted to experience it. So we had two LED large screens, you know, entertainment leading up to it, entertainment afterwards, and the amount of people that were there was just amazing. And they literally came from all over the country, you know, for that. You know, being a, another year removed from uh, COVID, we were able to bring back a fan fest, and we were able to bring back former major league ball players that signed free autographs for fans from all over and people loved it. They stood in line for hours to be able to get a, a baseball signed by Ken Griffey Sr. or a jersey signed by Ferguson Jenkins or Ben Zobris or some former major league ball player. The people's experience that are coming here, you know, just for the games and for the tickets, but everybody else that just wants to be a part of it, you know, was incredibly unique. And then the entertainment, the food vendors, all the different things, you combine all that together, it just makes for a very powerful experience for people when they come. I don't think you can put a price tag on the on the the impact. I mean, literally, we had people calling us, you know, that uh, uh, were from Iowa that don't live here anymore, and said, "I've never been more proud to be from the state of Iowa than I am right now." Uh, just to show, you know, our the landscape and the, our rural heritage and such with this, because that's really the element of that game is building this baseball, this Major League Baseball diamond and having this whole setting in a cornfield. You know, the corn is our biggest prop. And uh, we go to very large lengths to make sure that looks good. And I think from that perspective, you know, it's just, this is something that you dream of, of a region, especially in our industry as a destination marketing organization, you know, to have this and just to showcase what we have to offer here for people to come and see. So, you know, we're not Las Vegas, we're not Chicago, but we are a, a unique spot for people to be able to come and visit and really be able to enjoy things that are unique to our area. And that is the Field of Dreams. That is, you know, Dubuque and our, and our riverfront and all the other things that are in between. You know, Beyond the Game Festival, you know, I think is just a really, um, it really is a showcase of partnership from a county-wide standpoint to really, put your best foot forward as not one community, but multiple communities, and really showcase what we have to offer here to a, a national and international audience. I mean, all we have to do is look at the analytics that we're getting both from, you know, the Adara and that, the, for the different people that are coming here from all over, that alone, you look at the occupancy during that time frame. Our hotel motel tax over the last year and a half has skyrocketed you know, and continues to go. So, so once again, not only that, you know, that time frame of the game and leading up to it, you know, and such, but afterwards, you know, that exposure, you know, that awareness that people are, are seeing is like that, hey, we got to go there. You know, we, we want to go to, you know, Dubuque, Dubuque County and see not only the field and everything with it, but everything else that there is. So just that alone, I mean, we've seen it you know, as a destination, we've seen the analytics, we've seen all the different aspects that we watch, that we gauge how they're significantly going up during the since this. You know, once again, it's something as a destination marketing organization, you dream of, and we've had that uh, opportunity. And when an opportunity comes knocking at your door, you gotta step up to the plate, no pun intended, and try to hit a home run. And we have done that two years in a row. We are honored to be considered for the Bureau Innovation Award for this year's Upper Midwest CVB uh, convention. Uh, we've seen through the years all the different uh, communities that have presented on an amazing different events or different programs that they've had, and we're thrilled to be one of them under consideration. More incredible work from Travel Dubuque. Absolutely. Just incredible. Well, any other comments or discussion on that one? Okay. And we have a motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Are you doing what you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to council member reports. What reports do we have this evening? 
You heard about the bike ride. Yeah, Ms. Roussel, yeah. On, on Saturday, I was able to help with um, a red basket prop, uh, packing um, event, and it's just another one of our wonderful nonprofits in our community that are meeting an important need for women and girls in our community. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, yeah, I want to give a shout out to Adrian and her team for the picnic. Uh, for the commissions and boards and for all of the residents that uh, basically donate their time and energy to participate in how we govern here in the city. It was a great turnout. The weather cooperated. We had uh, just a beautiful evening and I think there was a lot of interaction and appreciation from our part and also from their part for, for all of us that were there. So thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that, Adrian. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jones. We've uh, had a few river boats. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more coming, so um, congratulations to everybody that's made that work. And, and uh, we've had days with uh, four boats, two in the harbor, two at the at the Port of Dubuque, and uh, and everything worked. And nobody fought, and everybody's glad to be there, and including me. So good that's stuff. Great. Yeah, that was a fun picture to get the four boats in the harbor. That's something you never thought you'd see growing up here, that's for sure. Ms. Wethel. Um, so I would like to uh, tell Adrian I appreciate that now my son's face or your face will be associated only with cookies for my son at the picnic. So thank you. I think that's all he ate. But, um, I wanted to mention the great street draw competition that was this past Saturday. Uh, there are, um, it was sponsored by Outside the Lines Galleries uh, downtown, and I have had my kids participate in it for years and. There's all different levels of competition, whether you're an artist or an adult or a group. Um, there was a mom and daughter together. There was a business that did it together. It was just a great community building experience. And for an hour and a half, it rained. And so a lot of them persevered and went back to wet pavement and started over. So I just uh, kudos to everybody who participated in um, a great community event every year, September. That was great. Thank you. Mr. Spring. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple weeks ago, I got to help at the Over the Edge event. I wasn't actually, I didn't go over the edge this year, but it definitely encouraged me to next year sign up to do that. Um, they, asked, they asked me to be on the roof just helping out with stuff. So I was more convincing people to go over the edge. So, <laughs> yeah, so, but thank you. At least somebody on the council will want to do that someday. Good for you, Mr. Sprank. Thanks for doing that. Well, I wasn't able to be at the uh, the boards and commissions picnic last week, unfortunately. It was a big disappointment, but it, um, it was because I was actually in St. Louis at the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative annual meeting. Um, the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative is actually a group of all the mayors up and down the Mississippi River. So all the way from Minneapolis and St. Paul all the way down to New Orleans. And it is um, what I found to be a, a, just a fascinating discussion of all that happens on the river and all that the river means to who we are and who everybody is up and down the Mississippi. Along with that, uh, when you get a bunch of cities together along the major waterway of the United States, you get a lot of people paying attention in places like Washington, D.C., for instance. So um, it is a great opportunity for us as a city of Dubuque to be able to advocate for what we need and um, you know, especially when it comes to things like building along the infrastructure of the river that we need. We've been talking about flood walls and making sure that everything is where we need it to be. Um, I talked to several members of the Army Corps of Engineers about the lock and dam system and some of the upgrades that we're gonna be seeing coming from those. Um, and hopefully on the upper part of the Mississippi because the southern part gets a lot of uh, uh, attention on that. So it was a great meeting. I'm glad I went and I'm looking forward to being able to join them again and I'll be sure to keep you updated on all that. Well, with that, I see we have a closed session here this evening. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move that the City Council go into closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending real estate transactions and pending, pending litigation. Good. Okay, I got a motion by Jones, second by Roussel. For the record, the attorney the City Council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in the closed session is City Attorney Crenna Brumwell. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session.